Tonight, Muslim fans of Sinead O'Connor in grief and shock, while the media wipes out the Irish star's Muslim identity and tensions flare in the old city of Jerusalem as Israel's far-right minister pays an unwelcome visit to Al-Aqsa Mosque. Later in the show, to commemorate tomorrow's Day of Ashura, we revisit an interview about the life and impact of Imam Ali ibn Ali Talib. He was the only person who was actually born and martyred in the house of God. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. This is Muslim News Canada on Muslim Network TV. I'm Catherine Bullock. Sinead O'Connor, a renowned Irish musician, politician and activist, has died. Adopting the name Shuhara Sadakat after her conversion to Islam in 2018, many Muslims are expressing disappointment that her religious identity as a Muslim is not being adequately highlighted in tributes. The 56-year-old singer was found unresponsive in her London residence. The UK police rule out any suspicious circumstances. Sadakat announced her decision to embrace Islam on Twitter, sharing images of herself in hijab and reciting the Islamic call to prayer. She continued using her name, Sinead O'Connor, for work. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has made the largest shakeup in his cabinet since taking office in 2015. He has elevated seven new members and dropped seven key members. He also revamped some cabinet duties. Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland and Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie remained in their positions. Omar al Rabra, Joyce Murray, Helena Jasek and Carolyn Bennett, who announced before the shaker that they would not be running for office in the next election, are part of the seven who are out. Political pundits say the shakeup is designed to put a fresh face on the Trudeau government to show the Liberals are re-electable. The next election has to be held on or before October 20th, 2025, but could be called before that date. Israel's far-right National Security Minister, Itamir Ben-Gavir, for the third time this year, has led a group of over 1,000 ultra-nationalist settlers to the Al-Aqsa compound in occupied East Jerusalem. While the status quo agreement prohibits Jews from praying at the site, some were seen praying and singing during the visit. On the other hand, Palestinian Muslim worshippers attempting to enter were turned away. The visit occurred on Tisha B'Av, a day of fasting and mourning for the destruction of ancient Jewish temples. Ben Gavir declared the site's significance to Jews and asserted their sovereignty over it, emphasizing the unity of the nation of Israel. It's worth noting that the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound is one of the holiest sites in Islam and a significant symbol for Palestinians. Certain hardline Israeli Jewish groups advocate for the destruction of the mosque and the construction of a third Jewish temple in its place, despite this being expressly forbidden by ultra-Orthodox Jews and Israel's chief rabbinate. For more on the life of and impact of Imam Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, stay tuned. In Ramadan, we're fo focusing on some important historical events, one of which was the assassination of Imam Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib. To talk to us about his life and impact, we have with us Dr. Leah Kat Takim. Welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for joining us again. Imam Ali, as known to, to Shia, the first Imam or the fourth Caliph for the Sunnis, was a very, very important figure in Islamic history. The first convert, uh, sorry, the first person to embrace Islam as a child and a male. Tell us, please, about his uh, his life. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, it is difficult to do justice uh, to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in such a short period. But very briefly, he was the only person who was actually born and martyred in the house of God. Ahmad ibn Hanbal was a great scholar amongst the Ahlul Sunnah. 
says very clearly that no companion of the Prophet has had as many excellences and fadail and merits as Ali ibn Abi Talib did. There are different uh, dimensions uh, to the life of Ali, and I'll try and just encapsulate it, uh, a few of them. He was the first one to collect and compile the Quran chronologically. In other words, he compiled the Quran in a chronological uh, um, way. But I should mention that the same Quran that we have uh, in our hands now. So the Quran that he compiled was no different from what we have now, except that it was chronological. He was also a teacher to the Lord Abbas. Let me stop you there. Sorry, let, let me just stop you there so we can unpack this one by one. What does it mean to compile chronologically? Because the Quran at the moment, as we know, is not in a chronological way. Whereas Ali ibn Abi Talib was receiving um, continuous instructions from the Prophet. And the, he compiled the Quran as and when, um, according to how it was revealed. That's what we mean by chronological. And is that important? It is important to know so that we can know exactly uh, what verse was revealed where and under what context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because context plays a major role in understanding the text. Okay. So now you were going to say a second thing? Yes. Um, he was also, as a person, deeply spiritual, completely devoted and committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we may call a God-centered person. One of the most important and beautiful verses revealed in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. Amongst the people are those who sell their own souls for the sake of pleasing God. This was revealed concerning Ali ibn Abi Talib. Interestingly, it was revealed on the night of the Hijrah, when the Prophet, as we know, left um, Mecca to go to Medina, and Imam Ali was actually sleeping on the bed of the Prophet. In other words, he was more concerned about the welfare and the safety of the Prophet than about himself. This was when it was revealed. So you're talking about uh, the night when he, he substituted himself when there was going to be a, an assassination attempt, showing his readiness basically to, to die in his place, the Prophet's place. Absolutely. Uh, he was deeply committed, committed to Allah and to the Prophet himself also. Hmm. I understand that he also married the, one of the Prophet's favorite daughters, Fatima. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, about their relationship? It was, yes, he married Fatima uh, and they had five children. Um, and um, it was a very uh, beautiful and wonderful relationship, uh, cut short simply because Fatima died soon after the death of the Prophet, within a couple of months um, of the Prophet's death. But uh, it, it was a wonderful relationship, as I said, in a short span of time, uh, they had five children. The Sunni and Shia perspectives on Imam Ali, how different are they? For the Shias, um, Imam Ali was the first Imam, that is one who was appointed by God to succeed the Prophet. This is the Shia belief. The Sunnis also highly revere Imam Ali as a very loyal and close companion of the Prophet, one who had great merits uh, um, and very close to the Prophet. For the Sunnis, he was the fourth Caliph. And I should also mention that the Sufis also adore and highly revere Imam Ali. Most of their turuk or silsila chains to the Prophet go through Imam Ali because of the spirituality of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Would you like to share one, one of those things with us? Yes. I mean, there's so much that one can say about the spirituality of Imam Ali. For him, he not only loved God, he adored God. For him, he called God from the very depth of his heart. So in one of the um, du'as that he left for us, he says that, Oh my Lord, supposing I can bear the punishment of your fire, how can I bear to be separated from you? In other words, separation from God was more painful for Ali ibn Abi Talib than the punishment um, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was very, very spiritual. There are many, many uh, du'as or supplications that he left behind us, which shows his complete dedication and commitment uh, to the will of Allah. There are the munajat, conversations with God, too many for me to go over uh, in this short interview. 
one of these things that I've heard the Sonnies talk about is the after we finish prayer, we do counting on our fingers of the of the uh, glorification of God and thanks to God and things like that. And that this uh, advice actually came to us from a situation between uh, Ali and Fatima when they had been uh, working very hard and were, and were very tired. And Fatima had asked for a, a servant, and the Prophet had advice, "I'll give you something better than a servant." Is that also a story that? Uh, animates Shia uh, prayer? Absolutely, it is. Uh, in fact, uh, the Shias call it Tasbih al Fatima or Tasbih al Zahra, meaning the same thing that you mentioned, which is the uh, Tasbih or Subhad that the Prophet taught to his daughter uh, in glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's part of our spirituality too. At the beginning of our interview, you mentioned uh, he. I think I heard you say that he was the only one to die in the haram. Is that what I heard you say? In the mosque of the Prophet. He was born in the uh, uh, in Mecca itself, in the Kaaba, according to many, many reports. And he was assassinated in the mosque in Kufa. So please tell us that sad story. Yes. Uh, before I go to that story, I would just very briefly like to say something about uh, his humanity. Because without understanding his humanity, we cannot really appreciate the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Um, in one of the letters that he wrote uh, to um, one of the letters that he wrote to his um, governor in Kufa, that is Malik al Ashtar, he says that there are two kinds of people. One are those who are brethren in faith in Egypt, because Malik was in Egypt, and also those who are your equal in humanity. In other words, you must treat all human beings alike. You cannot differentiate that. I'll treat one person better because he or she is a Muslim and the other one is not. On the contrary, everyone should be treated equally. Similarly, there is a very beautiful anecdote that once he was walking the street of Kufa with his companions and he saw a poor man who was obviously very hungry with very poor clothes. And Ali turned to his companions and said, Mahada, what is this? They said, this is just a Christian visiting Kufa. And Ali said, I did not ask you who is this. I asked you, what is this? Whether he is a Jew or Christian, Muslim, whatever, it doesn't matter. He's a human being and respect his humanity. Feed him, clothe him. Because as long as Ali ibn Abi Talib is the caliph, no human being will walk around in his state dressed like that. So brothers and sisters in faith and brothers and sisters in humanity, that's a very important teaching. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are so many others that I can cite. But, you know, basically he was a person who was totally committed to social justice. And therefore, when he died, he only barely had 700 dirhams, which is very little in today's terms. Um, very little. Even though he could have amassed wealth, he was, if you like, the caliph of the time. He could have accumulated wealth the way that other caliphs did. But no, he lived a very, very simple life. Uh, he or gold and silver, go and deceive somebody else, not Ali. Too bad our current leaders aren't, don't have that mindset. I, I think we're getting close to the end, so let's just talk a little bit about the assassination and the historical impact. Yes, he was assassinated by a person called Abdullah uh, the Muljim, Abdul Rahman bin Muljim. Basically, this man was a Kharij. The Kharij is what we may call the fundamentalists of that time, believing that only they knew the truth and anybody else who believes otherwise was wrong. Uh, he was killed primarily because Ali ibn Abi Talib was forced to accept their arbitration as Sifin. A group of Ali's army then left uh, him, and this is why they're called the Khawarij or Kharijis, those who exited from Ali's army. And they believed, they went so far as to believe that Ali became a kafir, na'udhu billah. So they planned to kill Muawiyah, Amr bin As, and Ali bin Abi Talib. The others two, the other two escaped assassination, but Imam Ali, as he entered uh, the mosque of Kufa, some say, while he was in prayers, Abdullah ibn Abdul Rahman bin Muljim struck him on the head, uh, and then Abdul Rahman was caught, by the way, and punished accordingly. But this was a great, great, um, I think, blow to the uh, Islamic history. One of the darkest uh, period of Islamic history was the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's why uh, a lot of commentators call the current Muslims who turn to violence near Kharijites. Yes, and I would like to share one uh, particular anecdote, if I may. I know we're running short of time. That after Ali ibn Abi Talib was buried, when his sons were going back to their home, Hassan, the son, heard a poor man cry. The poor man was obviously could not even see. And Hassan asked him, why are you crying? 
He said, for three days now, the person who should sit back and come and feed me is no longer coming. And Hassan said, who was that person? The man said, look, I cannot see, but I used to ask him, who are you? Why do you come to me? And he said that he, this person was telling me, al miskinu jalis al miskin. A poor man is sitting next to a poor man. This was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He would go searching for the poor, for those less fortunate, and would sit and talk and feed them. Well, as you said, that's hard to scratch in 10 minutes the depth of, of such an important and uh, inspiring man. But thank you for joining us to give us a glimpse. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for watching Canadian Muslim News. If you like what we do, please share, like and subscribe. Stay safe and God bless.